Financial independence, retire early. Sounds ideal, doesn't it? But it's not just a dream for many, it's an actual movement. What does it take to be able to achieve a comfortable early retirement? Every single person I've ever met reaches financial independence, usually quits their you know, their rat race sort of job and retires from that and then goes into a field that they're passionate about and every single one of them somehow makes money. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as down Download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the fire movement in Australia, and we're joined by Matt, host of the Aussie Firebug podcast, who likes to be known as a country boy from regional Victoria who is on track to reach financial independence and retire early by his mid 30s. And of course, FIRE is the acronym for financial independence and retire early. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. We're really interested in learning more about the growth of this movement in Australia. Pleasure to be here, Veronica. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Matt. I mean, I guess a good place to start is, you know, what's really driving this sort of fire movement? You know, how big is it? You know, when's it really sort of kicked off? I mean, what are those some of the bigger questions around the fire movement? I can only speak for myself about why I got interested in the fire movement, but let's, I guess, go back a bit to the history of it. Some would say it's been around since the 90s. There was a book that was released by Vicky Robbins called Your Money or Your Life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that that was the the start of the, the fire movement, but I would actually argue that it really started, or the modern day fire movement started when a guy called Pete, he wrote a blog called Mr. Money Moustache back in, I think he started in like 2011 or 2012, maybe a little bit, even a little bit earlier, but long story short, he retired when he was 30 and he amassed so much wealth that he could reach financial independence by the time he was 30 and move on to other things. And his blog become really, really popular in America. And I actually stumbled across it in 2013 and it completely changed my life. And I was at the point, I started full-time work at the end of 2011 and I I actually didn't mind the the job that I was doing, but I was sort of blown away by how many hours a week it was taking up of my life. And not only just the work time, but the commute, getting ready for work, you know, decompressing after work, doing all those things. I just, I was like, is this really going to be my life for for the next 40 years? Hmm. And I started to, you know, read a few actually property investing books. And I wasn't into the share market back then, but I just refused to accept that that was sort of the the life that was that I was going to live for, for the next couple of decades. And yeah, just sort of completely changed the course of, of my life when I come across uh, Mr. Money Moustache and what Pete was writing about. And then I started the first fire blog, I believe back in 2015 in Australia and since then, there's been a whole bunch of other blogs and podcasts pop up mm. all around the country. And it's hard to know how big it is, but I would say, I think there's a subreddit of the, over 100,000 people that are interested in the movement. So yeah. um, if that gives you any indication, it's pretty big, I think. It's so interesting because particularly in the property space, you hear these quotes all the time, oh, retired at 30 or retired at 28, amassed 15 properties, all this sort of you know pipe dream stuff. And I always think to myself, Okay, so why are you still working to sell this supposed system if you really have retired? And so I know in the property space there's a lot of charlatans around touting that they've retired but they haven't really. What makes the FIRE movement different? I would say different as in if Do someone really is- retire. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, well, that's a that's a good question because – Even the word retire means a different thing to different people, depending on who you ask. And I know that there's, this is probably the, the biggest thing that trips up most people about the five movement is definitely the retire early part. And I've written a fair bit about it and it's not actually about not working. That's the thing. I I think uh, some people, when they listen or read about the movement, they think, 
you know, how could you not work for, you know, the next 40 years, you retire at 30, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to sit by the beach and sip pina coladas all day? <laughs> Which is not actually what the movement is about. It's about having that choice and yep. the freedom to do what you want, when you want, without anyone telling you how to do it. Yep. And I actually, I think meaningful work is a staple of a human. I don't think someone can be happy without meaningful work in their life, mm. but it's the key word there, meaningful work, because most people go to work to receive money. And I, I'm, I'm still in that boat. I'm in the accumulation phase where I haven't reached financial independence, but there are parts of my job that I really like. But if we're being honest, I, I would I don't know the statistics behind this, but what would you say? 90% of people go to, go to their place of employment to receive a paycheck. There's other benefits associated with that work, but most people are there to get money, let's yeah. be honest. When you reach financial independence, the thing that changes is you can still work but you're working on your own terms and there's a world of difference between the two, going to work for money and going to work because you want to and you want to stimulate that, whether it be the creator itch that you have or working with people or you know being social, whatever it is that you get out of work, that's really the, the sort of the end goal. For me anyway, is to reach a point where I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, but that includes meaningful work. So the, you, the other term you used was freedom. And that's really it in a nutshell, isn't it? You you have choice, but what are the steps to get there? Yeah, that, that is true. The, the choice is, is a huge component of it. The steps are relatively easy. Like if we, if we break it down to its, the core concepts, it's literally spend less than you earn, invest the surplus of money, and then wait long enough. And depending on how much your savings obviously going to dictate how long it takes you to get to financial freedom, but usually there's a you know a few years, a few decades even, and you'll eventually reach financial independence. I it's love about, it. Yeah, it's it's like, a, that, it's that, like that's the simplest stay, term. It's like how to be thin and fit. <laughs> exactly right. There is no there is no magical formula. That's the other thing that people mm. sometimes read about this movement, and I get these emails all the time. It's like you know I'm 32 at the moment. You're like, wow, well, you know you're, you're 32, your partner's 29, you got this portfolio like. What was your secret? And I always say like, mm-hmm. there, there is no secret. It's just the, the hardest bit is saving consistently and investing consistently and sticking to the plan. And mm. if you compound that over years and decades, it's incredible what sort of wealth that you can build, but it's really simple. And back to your point about you know losing weight or staying fit, it's really, really simple. I, I, I'd like to think that most people know the foods they should be eating, what they should be doing, exercising and everything. Like it's really simple, but it's just executing it is usually the hard part and people go looking for that magic pill or that that magic fruit or vegetable or whatever it's going to do to, you know, miraculously mm. transform their body. But it just, we know deep down that it doesn't work like that and you've got to put in the work. So you mentioned, um, I mean, 90% of people don't sort of enjoy their job. And I think Gallup's, uh, you know, has research out there that sort of says that around 90% are disengaged and, don't get fulfillment from mm. work and they're just rocking up to sort of get the paycheck. Yeah. So I think that aligns to what you're saying. But, I mean, one of the challenges is, you know, could you just reframe work? Could you, you know, extra study? Could you go into a different industry? You know, one of the challenges of that other model is, well, I'm not going to make that choice until I've got sort of financial independence. So do you see that that's a, a bit of a challenge or people are stuck just on that rat race, earning the money, doing a job they don't like till they get to the end of this fire movement? Yeah, that's that's a uh, another very good question. So, a, a common, you know, some people will say, "Do what you love, and you'll never work a, another day in your life," mm. which is true. But I just think it's it's sort of a pipe dream for most people. Like, if I'm being um, mm. honest, like yep. it's not realistic for the majority of the population for everyone to love their job. Like, like come on, let's let's be real here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, in saying that, I definitely agree with you that when you're first starting out, sometimes it can feel it's almost uh, uh, detrimental to your mental health a little bit, a uh, discovering fire super early. Like I remember when I was, I think I, I stumbled across it, uh, the, the concept of financial independence from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the famous book from Robert yep. Kiyosaki. Saki. Yep, Saki, that's it. Uh, and that that completely blew my mind because that was when I'd never seen it written so simply the equation to financial freedom. I didn't even know what financial freedom was until I read that book. And it was simply, you know, assets generate money and it doesn't matter what assets it can be you know precious metals property shares whatever it is just gather enough assets 
and they'll eventually throw off enough income and you'll never have to work another day in your life. And I was like, whoa, like my brain exploded. <laughs> and then what Pete at Mr. Money Mustache was writing about was financial independence on steroids because a lot of traditional finance books and it, whether it be property and shares, whatever, is sort of geared towards reaching that financial independence later on, like when you're yeah. maybe 55, 60, 65. But what Pete and the FIRE movement is about is is supercharging that and reaching it early on in the piece in your 50s, 40s, 30s. And sometimes if all the stars are aligned, you can actually do it in your uh, 20s, but it's very, very rare. Do you think frugality plays a lot part of this though? A hundred percent. The minimalist movement, I mean, and, you know, if someone does want to live a pretty, not extravagant, but at least travel and go stay, you know, experience, you know, expensive experiences, how does, how does that align with a fire movement? Or do you have to sort of give up on those type of motivations and focus on spending less or for the rest of your life? So uh, this is like a, a common misconception as well. And I just want to say that, the FIRE movement is more of a philosophy on how to live your life than it is a, it, than it is a financial movement. Like everyone thinks that everyone in the FIRE movement, movement are investing geniuses and, you know, we've got all the answers and that secret pill to be able to retire so, so young. But what it's actually about is, is like you touched on there, Chris, it's more about stripping things down and finding out what makes you happy. And then putting the time and energy into those things. And if you actually think about and you jot down everything in your life that makes you happy, well, everyone's going to be different. But for me, a lot of the things that really make me happy don't cost a whole lot of money. And a lot of things that cost a lot of money is actually the marketing machine at work and like what society tells you how to live your life or how to have a good life. It's sort of the the chronological, chronological order of, you know, do well at school, study hard, get a good job, meet someone, buy a house, get married, have kids. Like that's sort of the fairy tale story that we're told when we're young and we got to follow that path. But life doesn't really work like that. It's and funny. You call that a fairy tale story. It sounds horrific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's just like. You said to me, you know, traveling five star around the, around the, the earth and. <laughs> amazing experiences and dining incredible restaurants and rest of it. That to me sounds exciting, you know, and that's going to cost a bloody bomb. <laughs> well, it, it can, it it can, but you can also do a lot of those things a lot cheaper, uh, it, you know, if you, if you plan ahead. But to, I, I just want to touch on that point again, Chris, about the mm. whole fr- frugality thing. So yes, the majority of people in the fire movement, if you look at their annual expenses, most normal people will probably be like, how the hell can you only spend that much money yeah. a year? Like there, there's no getting around <laughs> it. And all I can say with that is I think I live a fantastic life. And if you are following the fire movement and you feel like you're depriving yourself of a lot of life's luxuries and happiness yeah. and joy, then you're doing the movement wrong. Like really you should be living the 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 best life that you can live but also be conscious with what you're spending on and really put your time and energy into things that truly make you happy because what you'll find is that those things don't usually cost an arm and a leg. So it's not a miser movement. It's a mindful movement. I don't know what well, a this, miser movement is. Well, What's mi- a miser movement? Misers are mean, you know, they're tight with their money. So the idea, you know, that, that and even the word frugality in some regards conjures up this idea of being really tight and miserable about it. But uh, what you're yeah. saying is actually, well, it's, mm. it's, it's sort of better for the planet anyway as well. There's lots, 100%. lots of, yeah, lots of knock on a good knock on effect. You're, you're basically saying it's a mindful, it's being very conscious yes. about what we derive pleasure from rather than being sucked into the marketing vortex, mm. as you mentioned, and probably why we couldn't find you on social. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I try to stay. I watched that um, that documentary on Netflix. Um, mm, the shocking, social, isn't it? Yeah, I, I t- like literally deleted my Instagram account straight after, and the, wow. I, and I had uh, the only reason I was still on Facebook for a brief period is because I had my Aussie Firebug account still on Facebook. But yeah, it's just it, you know, I, and to be fair. Me and my partner have traveled around the world for the last two years. We got back in Australia in January uh, mm. at the start of this year. So, like, it's not like we aren't living a good life. It's not like pe- sometimes people think to be, a- to be able to achieve that savings rate 
or to, to be able to save that much money and to amass that portfolio at su- such a young age, you either mm. have to be given a, a massive inheritance, win the lottery, have an incredible salary, or have to live in a cave and eat nothing but rice and beans. And that simply isn't true. Like I actually think we live uh, an incredible life. Eve, I'd even th- say that we live an above average life globally, definitely. Like just being born in Australia sort of, yeah. you've already won the geo lottery 100%. Mm-hmm. Like we traveled two months last year in Southeast Asia. And let yeah. me tell you that if you you know it, spend a good chunk of time in a third world country, you will know how good we have it in Australia. And there's just so many things that we waste money on and we spend money on that is completely over the top. And I still do it. Like, don't get me wrong. I have, you know, Samsung Galaxy S10. I've got a smartwatch. Like these heaps of crap that I still buy that is completely mm. unnecessary. But I guess that we just avoid and we optimize the hell out of the big ticket items. That's where you get the biggest bang for your buck. And if you're just aware and conscious of those big ticket items, it is insane the wealth that you can accumulate over a decade. So children though, I mean, have you, uh, I'm not sure if you and your partner are thinking about it, but I'm sure a lot of people in your fire movement hemisphere are going to have kids. Absolutely. Have you noticed that their whole attitude towards fire, what they thought was possible, you know, the values they potentially of work that they need to instill in their children, how, do, how are children that shifting what they, you know, their, their fire beliefs? Uh, as in spending money or like the way they live their life? There's lots of elements to children. There's, you know, a lot of people would want security. They want stability for schooling. They want instill attitudes of work in their children. Costs go up. Housing needs are changing. You know, pre-kids, it's easy to sort of be frugal, live live cheaply, travel the world. But then when children come along, values shift and, and things that you want to provide shift and expenses and how you live your life shift and you can't just travel like that so from your experience where, where people have had children maybe not yourself because you probably didn't sound like you're at that stage but the people in the fire movement when they hit this sort of children phase do their attitudes shift around fire um well it's funny you mention that because we me and my partner are actually meant to get married in two weeks up in Queensland and I'm in Victoria. So it, it ain't looking like it's going to happen the way, the way, oh, the way no. I know. Don't, don't even get me started on it. Like it's, it's a big That's drama. You don't need to be married to have kids. Yeah, yeah well, True. Um, I, I did promise my uh, late grandmother that I would and I was planning to get married anyway. So, um, But we, we are planning to have kids, me and my partner, and there is no denying that cost will rise once we have kids. And it's actually a major reason we ha- we are currently unconditional on a house. Now, this is the mm-hmm. first house that we've ever bought that wasn't an investment property. Mm. And I've actually, that's a, a another you know topic that we can touch on if you guys mm. want to about yes. how many people buy a, an extraordinarily, extraordinary big house, like a four bedroom on a 800, 900 square meter block at 22, 23, that I think stifles their ability to to generate wealth and to to amass wealth, but that we can we can get into that in a second. But yeah, yeah this is our first house that we've ever bought. We have rented our whole lives, and the reason that we bought the house, to your point, Chris, is because we want that stability when we have kids. That is the reason that we bought mm-hmm. the house. So yes, things did change. If we weren't having kids, I think we'd be happy to rent our whole lives. Yeah, and that might shock a lot of people, but in the fire community. It's definitely, uh, I'd say probably it's more to the norm than it is to buy a house because really in my eyes, the the biggest advantage of buying a house is that stability. Like if you're young, I don't know why, especially if you're in a capital city, like especially if you're in a capital city, if you work out how much you pay in rent versus how much your property is worth, in Sydney or Melbourne, the, the, the math really adds up. Not so much in the country where I'm from, but if you're in Sydney or Melbourne, to buy a house and to make the repayments is usually significantly more expensive than to just pay rent and to save the difference. Mm. And there's a whole, there's heaps of things to consider there. Like, are you a natural saver? Like, can you actually save the difference if you're renting yeah. in one of these cities? Like heaps of things to consider. But I just think if you're young, you've got no dependents, no kids or anything like maybe you want to change jobs every, like in a few years, maybe yeah. you want to go to a new city, maybe you want to travel like, you don't need to jump into the housing market. You can if that's what you want to do, but yeah. it's just like I hope these young people know what they're getting themselves into 
when they buy so young. And I know that society, especially in Australia, puts them on a bit of a pedestal that they're so successful, which, hey, like if you want to, if you can buy a house at a young age, like, and you want to, then that's awesome, you know, good on you. But I just hope you know the opportunity cost you're giving up to tying yourself down with such a big mortgage at such a young age. Besides stability, was there other factors you made in terms of that housing choice? You know, if you have more than one child, if you want those children to go to certain type of schools or to be access to certain lifestyle, reduced commute, well, maybe you're not working. So, you know, what other factors did you base your decision purely besides stability? Because you can get stability, you can get a roof over your head, and that's not what drives housing or unaffordability. It's those other factors. So what other factors did you make as part of your decision? Uh, to be honest, it, it was mainly stability. And the probably the other big factor was that it's even in my country town of 25,000 people that I live, there is no places to rent in here. Like <laughs> well, I'm, that's, I'm, yeah. I'm not kidding you. It's crazy. The the vacancy rate is like zero. It's, it's just bananas. And- to be honest, we knew we wanted kids. So stability was really the big driver, Chris. So like that's yeah. to be honest. If And I'll tell you what, if Australia had tenancy laws like they do in other parts of Europe, like I've got a cousin in Germany, I know Amsterdam does it, like mm. you can literally take out 20, 25 year leases and like the house sort of becomes yours to a certain extent as the renter, which might shock a lot of Australian landlords hearing this. But it's just a completely different culture over there. You're not, you know, people don't look down upon people as much if they rent, which has never bothered me at all, but I'm just saying that it's a completely different culture. So really the the big reason that we bought was stability, to be honest. And do you think that would be possible if you, for example, wanted to fire plus live in a capital city in a, you know, in a ring or an sort of higher end expensive area? Absolutely. But it would just be harder. Because it's just a numbers game. To reach financial independence is just about math, really, and about how much you can save and you know how well your investments do. So it's a hundred percent possible. Are you going to do it on an average income and reach fire early? Probably not. Pro- are you going to reach financial independence maybe in your forties and fifties? Yeah, hundred percent, definitely could. Like it depends on a whole bunch of things, but buying in a capital city, will, you know, there's no getting around it. It's, mm. it's expensive. So it's going, to, it's going to put you back. You mentioned something earlier. You said you sometimes you feel like you discovered fire too early, too young. Mm. What did you mean by that? Uh, it was depressing, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> so I, I discovered it, I think, oh, it was, what, 2013? So it would have been 25 or something or 24. And I just remember like coming across this movement, getting really excited and then being like, damn, it's like, a decade away till I get to this point. <laughs> and it was bad for my mental health because I was quite enjoying my job yeah. until I got yeah. to that point and I'm like, oh, like this sucks. And now every single time the boss was telling me to do something or, you know, <laughs> had a bad interaction at work, it, it just compounded and I felt like I was trapped. And it, it, was, it was a bad way to think. I, like, I don't know how you get around that though, but it's, it's almost like I wish I come across it sort of middle towards the end because then I wouldn't have felt like, there was another way and I just would have been maybe contempt and happy with, you know, working for another couple of decades. What's so weird about that is that I hear that and I think, well, if you didn't come across it, you wouldn't have actually applied the practices. You're right. You're right. It's and a double-edged sword. Yeah. I mean, I would be more depressed if I discovered it at 35 or 45 than 25. Do you know what I mean? Like, because- 100%. You got the, the wrong way and that's what you need because this is all just about the magic of compounding, isn't it? 100%. The compounding is- and I, and we are towards the end of the journey now. And like, you know, let me tell anyone out there that's listening, that if you're at the start of the fire journey or even just any wealth creation journey, it's so hard to understand compounding. Like you can understand it. You chuck it in a calculator, you, you get the mathematics fine. But until you get to, I'd say probably the sweet spots for us was like maybe a hundred grand in, in net worth or, you know, a hundred grand in assets it starts to really throw off some numbers. And then once you go up, up and up, it's just yeah. like it just turns into a beast of its own yeah. and it's just on autopilot and it just does its thing. It's it's a magical thing, compounding. It is a wonderful one. It's a, What's a eighth wonder of the world or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the period. <laughs> but, um, I mean, what are some of the risks you see with the I – mean, I've been a financial advisor for a long time and lots of forecasting and, you know, a lot of it comes down to – 
the costs you want to spend on an annual basis. And that can change, you know, health or, you know, just affordability, inflation on different things go up at different rates, you know, housing, for example. But what are some of the things that you think where people get it wrong with the fire movement? You know, an example could be you retire too early, right? You think you've got fire, but you're putting 9% capital you know returns every year and you're not really being realistic about your expenses and you get out of the workforce and then three years later you're like oh i need to go back to work and <laughs> you've got this big gap on your sort of cv so you know what are some of the things where you think people get the fire movement wrong with not you know i guess taking it serious enough the the biggest risk with the fire movement is missing out on life early on in the journey let me just put a warning Mm. to people listening that I don't regret many things in life. And I don't like to even use the word regret. It like, you know, it sucks. Don't like to think about it, but I didn't go that the one, one of the biggest things I regret is there was a boys trip. It was a a Euro Euro trip that I declined when I was in my mid twenties that I could have afforded to go easily because I was in the accumulation phase and I was grinding away and I was, I was really starting to see some gains on my, I update my net worth every month just to keep track. And I was like, that is going to put a spanner in the works. I set these hard goals and I really wanted to achieve them. Mm. And now I look back and it's like, what the difference that trip would have made is minuscule in the the grand scheme. And <laughs> like, I really just want to echo this point that, you can't get your 20s back. So just be aware of that. I'm not saying go like go YOLO and, you know, start buying the latest <laughs> iPhone and like, you know, buy Versace shoes, whatever. But I'm just saying that those trips and those experiences, you like you can never do Europe in your 20s ever again. Even if you go back and you do South <laughs> yeah. Croatia in your 50s, it won't be the same trip. It so. can be better, trust me. But what is so interesting <laughs> about that is that if you don't make those sacrifices, then you're not actually going to be able to achieve it. You know what uh, I mean? Like it, so, it, it, ha- there, it sacrifices though in the right areas. So I would always say that travel and personal growth and investing in yourself is hmm. super important and that's something else that like a, a major part of it. Don't be stingy when it comes to yourself and your own development because – the biggest gains and the biggest, the way that you can leapfrog your way to financial independence, in my opinion, is, and this took me years to to figure out really because I was sort of happy in my little job and just like grinding away and saving a good chunk of money. And it wasn't until I moved to London in 2019 and I went into the contracting space and London was an area where my skills were in higher demand than they are in the country. Like I was on a pretty good wicket compa- like comparatively to my country peers, but mm. when, I, when I moved to London, I more than doubled my salary. And I just want everyone out there listening to know that I was on a very high salary towards the end of my journey. And I'm aware that me, me and my partner earn slightly above the medium Australian, Australian national income. And I don't want that to sort of take away from the fact that you can definitely reach financial independence at a young age on a normal income or an average income. Because a lot of people think you need, a, you know, a super high salary. You absolutely don't. But the truth is that when I went to London, I was on a relatively large salary. But that lesson taught me that if you go to places where your skills are in demand, or you upskill yourself, and you can maybe jump uh, jobs to to get a bigger income, mm. it can really, really supercharge your way and wipe years off the journey to, towards financial independence. So investing in yourself, maybe looking at other jobs every couple of years is is such a good way to, to boost your savings rate ultimately because if you're earning more money, as long as you don't fall into the trap of um, lifestyle inflation, you're going to be able to throw way more snow on the snowball as your yeah. portfolio is rolling down the hill. <laughs> well, it's I those always- two things, isn't it? Saving, which is higher income, yeah. and so investing in yourself and then cutting your expenditure and you know, that's probably a good thing for all of us to be doing is investing in ourselves. And I, I agree with you, Matt. But the other thing is uh, what your, your capital sort of growth rate of your investments are. And another danger I've seen with this whole fascination that I can quit a job I hate in five or 10 years time and is the what return number they put on that. You know, is it 6% a year? Is it 7% a year? And a lot of people have very short-term bias 
especially people who started the fire movement, you know, last year would probably be thinking that yeah. you're going to retire in three years' time. Yeah, this is easy. <laughs> but it also encourages speculative type of investing. And so this is whether it goes into property or whether it goes into shares or, you know, maybe Bitcoin. But where do you see that people get it wrong there where they, they think that they can not only save more but they can also retire early because they're going to get this magical investment return over the next five or ten years? Mm. So the – the magical number that majority, like 90% of the fire community go off is the 4% rule. Mm. And have you guys both heard of that 4% yep. rule? Yeah. yeah. But oh, listeners might so, not, so, so go away. Yeah. Okay. So it, it rough, roughly, it's based on a study called the Trinity study, which it was a US-based study. And it's not perfect because it was only factoring in a 30-year retirement. And to, to cut a long story short, what they basically did was they made a portfolio. I actually think it was 20% bonds. 80% equities, and they ran a, ran a simulation on all the data that they had on the stock market all the way back as far as they could go with it. And they said, if we withdrew 4% of the portfolio from, you know, starting from 1940, 1941, 1942, and, and modeled different outcomes of would the portfolio essentially last a 30-year period? There was something like 95% success rate where if you had retired and withdrew 4% of your portfolio from 95% of the years from the data that they had, the portfolio would not only last, but more often than not, it would actually grow larger uh, as you kept on going and kept withdrawing 4% of the portfolio. Mm. And in the 5% of cases that it did fail, yeah, you know, that- it, it, yeah. it would fail. And in that case, you would have to go back to work. So that's where the 4% rule comes from. Now, is it the be all end all? No, it's not. And I think this is a, a common misconception as well, that people think that like somehow everyone in the fire community is just has their fire number and that's set in stone and they're never going to make money ever again in their life, which is I, to be honest, I've never met anyone in the fire community that reaches financial independence, that doesn't go on to do meaningful work, that doesn't flip a buck in the end. Not because they were trying to make money, just because of they're doing something that they love. And 100% of the time, I've, I've yet to meet someone. I'm sure there is someone that just wants to read books <laughs> and, you know, like uh, sip pina coladas all day. I'm sure there, there's someone out there that wants to do that. But every single person I've ever met, reaches financial independence, usually quits their, you know, their rat race sort of job and retires from that and then goes into a field that they're passionate about and every single one of them somehow makes money, not not because they want to or they need to, just the way it works. And usually they don't they donate a whole bunch of it to charity or something and they might, you know, might keep a little bit or you know, they might do whatever they they want with it. But my point is we are fluid in the fire community. So once you reach your number based on the 4% rule, okay, you, you've, you've technically, you know, uh, according to that set of criteria, reach financial independence, but it's not to say that you're not going to have another source of income because like I said, 99% of the time you, you do. So I don't really see that as a, as a huge risk, if I'm being honest, Chris. And mm. in fact, <laughs> the, the majority of the fire people are in a way better position than- 99% of the rest of Australia. Like yeah. I always read these articles. It's like, oh, the stock market crashed. Like what's fire people going to do now? Like the, 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 you know, the plans, you know, thrown out the window. It's like, hold on. Every, these people in the fire community have million dollar portfolios and somehow they're in trouble because, okay, on paper, their portfolio might've went down, you know, 30% mm. last year with the you know eighth worst crash in stock market history, the coronavirus. They're still in a pretty good position, even if they have to go back to work you know, minimum wage or whatever, one, they got a hell of a lot of wealth behind them. And two, they live a frugal lifestyle. And majority of like 99% of people in the fire community live a simple life that doesn't mm. cost a whole, whole lot. So I don't know where, you know, the, some of these articles and these journalists write or how they come up with this idea that somehow a fire has failed when there's a stock market crash, because I don't know if they know, but like everyone in the fire community expects a crash to happen because that's just the nature of the markets. So that's my thoughts on that. So they're not naive. Uh, um, and I'm glad to hear that because, you know, I was just sitting there thinking while you were talking about the 4% rule, thinking, well, you know, there's a good chance you're going to have to go back to work at 65 <laughs> just when everyone hmm. else is actually retiring. <laughs> 
If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. I'm curious to know because what we haven't talked about is tax and and certainly when it, we're in regards to home ownership and that means the home you live in as opposed to mm. owning property as investments, there's a massive tax benefit in that. But, of course, that's a long-term benefit too because that's not realised until you actually sell. And obviously if you're going to sell down 4% of your portfolio, you know, every year you're going to be paying tax on on those gains, et cetera, et cetera. So where does tax planning come into this? And also actually, because in this country, uh, aligned with this sort of tax idea, we've got such a, a, a wonderful opportunity to have tax effective savings in superannuation. So how does how does the fire mm. community approach those issues or aspects? Yeah, great question. So I'll just, I just want to say as well, that 4% rule, it Factors in inflation and tax into into that, and it, this is circumstantial, so everyone's different. But I'm going to use us as an example, me and my partner. We track our expenses religiously, and I actually only do it like maybe once a week now. Whereas back in the day, I was a bit crazy. I used to do it like every single day, um, <laughs> just because I was obsessed. And yeah, it was I was way too full on. Back, back. More time on your hands. Yeah, than, than- oh, <laughs> I, I work for the government. I work for the government, so yes, uh-huh. there was a lot of free time. It was, um, it was a bit of a joke actually. <laughs> but I know to the dollar amount that we spend roughly fifty thousand dollars a year to maintain to for us to maintain our lifestyle costs fifty thousand dollars, and that's a pretty good life if I'm being honest. Like, you know, there there could be, you know, we could add other things. And there's going to be expenses coming up, especially with kids. So that number isn't set in stone. It's fluid. We are going to adjust as expenses rise in the future. Uh, but 50,000 is what we need. Mm. Now we have our assets in a trust. And if we go off the 4% rule, let's say we need $1.25 million in assets to generate 4% of uh, or w- a few dividends and maybe selling some stocks could generate that 4% per year to give us the Mm. $50,000 that we would need to maintain our lifestyle, assuming that we have absolutely no income from any other avenues, which will most likely not be the case. If we split that between me and my partner, that is almost like the amount of tax that we are paying on that $25,000 each is very, very little. It's it's hardly anything because the tax-free threshold is what, 18 and a half thousand or something at the moment. So you're talking about $6,000 and at a tax rate of, I, I, I should have had the the tax um, <laughs> numbers in front of me, but it, it's low. it's bugger all. It's very very <laughs> yeah, low. Yeah. yeah, if we split those b- between us, so that's the first point. So these are all benefit of frugality, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent less tax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and it's really interesting because I think we're we're in like the traditional fire because <laughs> within the fire movement, and I don't even know how I feel about this, but there's everyone's got to put labels on everything, but there's a whole like sub movement of lean fire, like traditional fire, and then high fire, which is like the high fire people want to want to sort of be balling in retirement and they want a passive income of like, you know, maybe hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So they're sort of on a different trajectory to the majority of fire people. And it's almost mm. like a movement within a movement. But then you get the lean fire people and my goodness, you should read some of these expense reports <laughs> that they post like and these are the people uh, that the journalists you know, post yeah. the story. And then everyone thinks that everyone in fire is like that when it's really not like that. And we actually had a survey at the start of the, the year with 1300 people in the community, you know, filled out the survey and the bulk of people are roughly within about 45 to like $70,000 a year, which I think is pretty like that. That's a typical, if you're optimizing all your expenses, I feel like that's pretty typical for a normal Australian family to, to spend that. Like I could see that being realistic. Mm. But you get these lean fire people that they spend so little <laughs> that they actually pay more tax. And this is incredible to think about. They would pay more tax from salary sacrificing into super than they would building a portfolio 
outside super and receiving their dividends or you know rental income because of the 15% tax that you pay when it go, when it goes into super whereas they actually are under the tax 3 f- threshold so it actually makes more tax sense for them to invest outside super than it does inside <laughs> Have, having yeah. said that having said yeah. that that is rare to have happen and majority of people vast majority will have the biggest tax benefits in super no shadow of a doubt no shadow of a doubt if you're especially if you're nearing the preservation age i would like if that was me i'd be dumping everything into super the only reason that we don't build up our portfolio in super the only reason is we don't want to use the drawdown method and have to rely on super or basically have to wait till our preservation age to get that money so I would Comes rather back to freedom, doesn't it? Exactly. I would rather yeah. pay a bit extra in tax and reach financial freedom outside of super than I would then like storing it inside. Even I know I've done the math on it, how much we would save in tax by salary sacrificing and uh, letting it compound in a tax uh, yep. low tax environment. Like that's amazing. I it, it's rare. Like and it goes back to circumstances. But if you're super early. On in fire, you maybe want to look at it like building your, your snowball outside of super. But for the vast majority of Australians, super is going to be your best bet. It's the best vehicle that you can have. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a, I guess there's a two elements to it though. But if ultimately your number that you're trying to achieve is to last you maybe to your 90 or 100, it would be you know, forever. Maybe forever. That number could be a lot lower. And so, you know, you could say, well, my super balance is that once that's at 300000 that's going to compound, you know, 200000 or 100000 that's going to compound for the next 30, 40 years. So I don't have to worry about that 65-year amount so I can potentially retire a lot earlier. So you can d- just do people in the fire community look at it like that and say, well, I want an outside of super amount and an inside of super amount to, to hit that button. 100%. I actually have a calculator on my website that does exactly that, that calculates how much you need outside mm. of super to then bring you to your preservation age. And then it, it, it works out how much you need inside. To, so it builds up that snowball rolls down the hill in the low tax environment. So when you get to your preservation age, boom, it's your financial independence number. And then it works out how much you need outside. Now, when I did my, our situation in that, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like, because we were doing it so young and this is where it throws it off and it's so circumstantial. So you need to really plan for your own circumstances is we, I can't remember exactly. So I'm just going to do rough figures here, but let's say our financial independence number is 1.25. Cause that's what it is. I know that for the time being, because we were so young, we were going to need an incredible amount outside super to then last us to our preservation age. Yeah. So it was something like maybe I'm going to say 700,000, we would need outside super. And I thought at that point, I'm like, if I get, if I've got seven hundred thousand outside super, do I really want to start drawing that down? I think I'd rather just save an extra five hundred thousand and pay more tax and just get to financial freedom without relying on super. That's mm-hmm. how I just looked at it, and I know it's not the most efficient and quickest way to get there. But I just chose. I don't want to do the drawdown method. I just want to reach it outside super, and I'm willing to pay a bit more tax. So, I mean, the, the other Veronica point was around the tax on home ownership where there's no tax and arguably leverage and leveraging income or leveraging any type of investing is where you'll get compounding better returns if you over the longer term. And property is one of those assets you can leverage six times, you know, seven times your income and your money you can leverage potentially 10 times and then potentially into asset that can grow tax-free for you. And if, if you look at sort of a way of sort of growing wealth, especially if you do it well, how do the people in the FIRE movement, because a lot of people will say their home, they'll say, I just want security, I just want a place to live. But ultimately, arguably, if you do it well, it's probably one of the better investments you can do as well. And how do people handle that? That is, that's a good question that I don't really think has been brought up that much in the community, the forum boards and the, the Facebook pages. If I'm just thinking about that myself though, I don't know, would I buy the best home that I, or, or the home that we would want to suit our lifestyle, like future aspirations, all that, all that good stuff, or would I buy a home because I think it would go up in value or like, because like it's slightly an investment. Like I know what you're saying, but I, I feel like, I feel like it's two different things. Because if I'm buying an investment property, which we, you know, we've had three investment properties before, we're down to one at the moment, but it's a hundred percent a numbers game. Like I don't care 
what it looks like, where it is, it, all that's a, like it is relevant, but it it's all tied back to how much money can this thing make? Like it's about making money in that investment property. Mm. But a house to me is completely different. There's an emotional attachment to that. And I just feel like if I was trying to buy a house and buy an investment property or buy it for an investment at the same time, I might not get best of both worlds. I don't know. Does, this this does is that really sense? interesting actually because I suspect – Listening to you talk about the difference between an investment property and your home, I suspect that you're less worried about the home growing in value because you aim to retire early, which means you won't have debt. And therefore, if you don't have debt, you're not as worried about the home going up or down in value because if it goes down in value and you have debt, you've got this sort of benchmark of what do you owe the bank versus what the house is worth. And so so that sort of becomes a different sort of th- thinking process. I guess one question in my mind is that if you have a frugal approach to life and you are, and also, I mean, I was reading up a bit on the fire movement before we had this podcast and this interview and one of the things I read about was, you know, like, the ideal is to invest in low risk, high yield. And I'm like, there's no such thing because risk is a function of yield. And I know in property that if you invest in cheap property, typically they're not very good assets. And people, if they're measuring their investment return on the yield alone and not on the capital growth, and they're actually missing the point. And, And I guess that's all of this is sort of wrapped up in my head. I'm thinking these are all danger zones for for the fire movement in my mind, and maybe I've got it wrong, because the fact is that if you invest wisely in your own home, it should and can grow in value because it's emotional to you. It will be emotional to other people. And the actual main driver of capital growth in property is actually owner-occupier demand. It's actually not all the investors, all the numbers, all that sort of palaver. Because mm. the reality is that properties are emotional. Those that are get the more emotional response from buyers are the ones that get where the price gets pushed up. So it actually, it, and that's sort of the fundamental of this podcast is actually understanding the, the psychology and the emotions behind our decisions around property. So it's sort of interesting to come at it saying, well, you know, that doesn't matter with my own home, but it actually does. And it does for lots of reasons. And it actually can be way more powerful than, than making investment decisions based on numbers alone. Mm. Yeah, I hear, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. Another way to explain it would be, let's say you believe in the fire movement, you don't believe in houses and asset because I'm living in it and financial houses shouldn't be a financial instrument. But the reality is we live in Australia where our number one asset is residential property, which is say four times the share market. And so absolutely it is a financial asset and it's everyone's biggest asset. And so even if you don't believe that the house isn't an asset, the reality is that's what the world is. And so you can either play in the system or you can sit on the sidelines with the system and say, oh, you know what, I don't believe in that. I'm just going to buy something to live in. But what you're also doing is you're missing out on that opportunity. And the way that the tax system is structured is around home ownership and encouraging people to take on home debt. That's what low rates are also doing as well and government grants, et cetera. And so even if you want to live this, you know, fire movement, one of the best investments you can potentially do is treat your home as an investment, you know, and think about it from an investment mindset. And chances are it's also going to be a great lifestyle asset anyway because that's what the best properties are. That's what they provide is lifestyle. And so, you know, I think there's a big opportunity where people potentially look at this fire movement and they say, well, I want to, you know, I've got 100,000 and I want to grow it so I can retire. I don't. That means I completely disregard property or I'll buy shares that are unleveraged and I'll try to get this compounding thing over 10 years and I'll pay capital gains tax on it. But with the home, you know, for example, let's say someone bought a million dollar house in inner west of Sydney you know, 10 years ago, and they bought it for a million and now it's worth 2 million. Well, that gain of say a million is all tax free. Maybe they put in a hundred thousand. And so they've got, you know, 10 times their money tax free versus that person who said, I'm going to rent, I'm going to save the difference and I'm going to slowly build an investment portfolio over 10 years. Like the, the difference in where they will be is, is massive. And so I think they, one of the challenges of the fire movement is, is that I think around home ownership, I think they are potentially missing the system benefit. The other thing is that it does encourage people to be frugal with their investment decisions as well. And so, for example, I will buy an investment property and I'll focus on cash flow because it's about, say, you know, the yield. 
but I will completely disregard the capital growth, which is what properties basically priced on. And so the number of properties matters more. I've got three properties and it's the yield they provide rather than the, the actual growth. Do you see that a lot of people in the five movement focus on a number of properties, properties that are say worth, you know, under say three, 400,000, a lot of regional property, high yield, sort of positive cash flow. Is that sort of what a lot of people in the five movement are attracted towards? I'm not hundred percent sure in terms of the property type that that most in the fire community would would lean towards but what i can say is it's true that in the fire community most people are trying to replace their incomes so they are going after assets that can generate an income now the issue that i have not an issue but just the point i'd like to make if you have the million dollar house in sydney and it goes up to two million dollars are you withdrawing the equity to further invest or are you just basically becoming rich on paper? Because if the house goes up, unless you're renting out a room or something like that, it's actually not providing an income if it's your primary place of residency. You can always sell though, right? So if if your number in the five movement is a number, then that person could sell at $2 million, pay off their $800,000 mortgage. Now they've got $1.2 million in the bank. They could move to a lower cost area outside Sydney, buy, buy a house at 250000 and they've got a million dollars in the bank that's going to provide them $40,000 a year income. Mm. They could. I'm not saying that they couldn't. All, all I'm saying is that uh, if I'm buying a house, I'm not relying on it to to have that happen, to, to turn it from $1 million to $2 million. And I know that it has happened in the last few decades. Will it happen in the future decades? I'm, I don't know. Will houses go up? 100% they will, just because of the nature of the markets. It, giving a long enough period, it 100% will. I prefer not to play the capital gains game where essentially you're relying on someone to buy the asset at a higher price than you paid for it. All the while, you're losing mo- real money in the bank account and your only payout is at the very end when you sell to someone at a higher price. I know, I know it can work. I know this is a strategy that a lot of people do, but I just would rather build up steady and slowly and have the consistent income being thrown off from the portfolio mm. and reinvest that income and do it that way. They're just two different games and it's just about the your risk have you profile. Ever, have you gone and- back and looked at potentially what, you know, when you had enough for a first deposit, let's say you had 15%. I don't know, let's say you had 100 grand and a decade ago, I think you started this in 2013, I think you said, and what your difference in terms of, you know, potentially you would be today. Um, well, I mean, if you I can invested in Sloan, Sydney real estate. Well, it depends on what you could have got access to with your incomes, et cetera. But it, it is it is something in the fire community that a district, because they've got that belief around sort of financialization of property, et cetera. Property is not an asset. I'm going to live in oh, there. Property is definitely an asset, 100%. I, I've made more money through property than I'll probably ever make through the share market. Don't get me wrong. My first property had an annualized return of something like 35%, which I'll never get in the share market unless I'm the next coming of Warren Buffett. So I'm not saying, I, and I'm almost sounding anti-property here, but I'm 100% not. It's I, I love property as an asset class. It's just, I'm at the time of my life where I, for, for me to get the returns in property and like the way that I was a property investor, because I'm not really anymore, I had to put sweat equity into the property and I had to do a few things to bump up the value where I wasn't, and I didn't like my original strategy. My very first strategy was to amass 10 properties. That's what the road that we were going down. And I hit three <laughs> properties and then APRA changed the lending regulations in Australia and I maxed out on my loaning capacity. I had like nearly like $800,000 in debt at one point and I went for my fourth house and then I got knocked back and that's when I started learning about the share market. And the reason that I was attracted to the share market was one, because it's 100% passive. I don't need to lift a finger. I get four payments of dividends each year. They get transferred into my account like magic and I'm like, wow, that's incredible. I don't have to deal with any tenants. I don't have to deal with any of that stuff, but I'm not (laughs) poo-pooing property at all because it's an incredible wealth building tool. They're just completely different tools. And I'd say that most people are more suited to be passive investors. Like I'd say probably like 70% of people are not built to be property investors because in my mind, there are certain things that you need to do 
and you need to treat it like a business almost. You need to treat property investing like a business. And if you don't, you can still make money, but you're less likely to make money and there's headaches and time energy that you got to put into it to make it work. That's why I went down, like we started in property when I had a whole bunch yeah. of time in my 20s and then, we've, then we're slowly going to 100% passive portfolio. It's a good point. I think that people underestimate how active property investment needs to be, particularly at, at 100%, times. 100%, yeah. And, and, but so you, it sounds like you manufactured wealth. It sounds like you actually made yes, improvements. that was my properties. strategy. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. uh, at sweat equity, I was laying concrete, yes, I was yeah. landscaping, yeah. and I just was like, <laughs> I, I, and that's why I said I, I made 35% or 33% annualized returns, but that's not factoring in how much my time is worth per hour. You know what I mean? That's just how much I got out of the, the deal. Like it was, I think I bought for like, 340 and I sold for like 515 or 520 in the outer skirts of Melbourne. So I made a really good profit. I was so happy with it. And like, I'll never mm. get that sort of bump in the share market just Over because- what period of time? Uh, f- I bought, two th- uh, built in 2012, when was it? No, 2013. And I sold in 2018. Yeah. So you got most of the, the big boom of, of Melbourne market. Um, yeah, just yeah, on the yeah. tail end of like it started yeah. to dip. And to be honest, I wish I held it, but hindsight's twenty twenty. So I oh, made yeah. a really good profit and I was happy with it. And I'm like, I try not to be a greedy person. I was like, yeah, I can dwell that it went up even more like crazy. Yeah. Like I look at the prices now, it's in the six, it's easy. But I'm happy with the profit I made. And anyone can look back in history and be like, damn, I should have bought Bitcoin. In 2013, you, you know what I mean? So it's like oh, you, you yeah. can play this game forever. Power of hindsight. Yeah. Never, never a mistake is made. <laughs> mm. So that's one of the things that I, you know, I, I think the fire movement's missing and I think they, around the home and understanding property and what drives the market, mm. and, uh, the system and behind, and even if you don't want to be a part of that, you want to avoid, you know, be different to the system and which I definitely align to a lot of that as well, the, they are missing a trick around playing the property market, you know, especially around their home. I think the other thing is that you you were kind of going down the dangerous path that I think a lot of the people in the fire movement do as well, where they think the number of properties, you mentioned there you wanted 10. What uh, unfortunately they do is they'll go for higher yield and they'll go for quantity and a lot of property spruikers play in this space. And they encourage people to go into, because it's a number, I've got to buy more at 300,000 and I'll get four and I'll get another one, another one. And what they do is end up getting not the greatest investment returns, those maintenance issues you spoke about, tenant risk, growth is in the affordability market, supply risk. And so what they should have just done is gone by one really top quality investment property for a million, let's say, but they go and try to buy this number of properties. And I, I think you'll find that a lot of people in the fire movement are, are thinking like that. They're thinking, I've got to get as many properties as I can. It's the number I sort of have rather than the quality. If you sort of Heard that around the traps? Actually, I haven't. And I'd probably say that like 80% of the fire movement go down the passive index share portfolio style of investing. There is not many property investors in the Aussie Fire Discussion Facebook group. I think we're up to like 12,000 members. And Chris, if you're not in there, I'd definitely encourage you to join and, and start this conversation because it is a good one. I'm like, I'm definitely hearing what you guys are saying for sure. It's just that for whatever reason, the passive index style approach of investing speaks and appeals to the majority of people trying to pursue fire. Mm. And I have seen stories written in that group from property investors that obliterate a passive index style investing return. And and a lot of some people are saying like, you know, is that really possible? And I'll, I'll you know chime in and say, yes, it is. Like property is an incredible wealth building tool. It is. It's just completely different to passive index style investing. Yeah. One is active that you have to treat. It's almost like a business. It's like a side hustle. It's completely different. And the other is 100% passive. You're not doing anything to improve it. So there are so many pros and cons with each style. Mm. You know, if you're a go-getter, you've got certain skill sets, you can add value to a deal, a transaction, a, a, the property itself, you're a builder, a sparky, whatever. Property could be incredible. It could be amazing for you. And with all the tax benefits that you guys speak about, but if you're someone that doesn't want to do the extra work, maybe you're time poor, maybe you want to put, you want to invest in yourself and build more income through your job, which I actually think is a, a good way to do it because, yep, yep. you know, then go, then passive is probably the best way for you because you don't want to have weekends where you're, you know, going down there, you're dealing with, with stuff and issues yep. that happen. Like they're just, they're just two different things. And I really, 
I want to, you know, make sure that everyone understands that fire is definitely not anti-property at all. I think it's incredible. I just think it's not suited for majority of Australian investors, to be honest. I think they think they're property investors, but once they start dealing with all the hassles, they're probably way better off doing a passive style, putting more money in their super and concentrating on other things. And yeah, that's how that's how I feel about that. I agree with you, by the way. <laughs> and good on for going pa- pa- passive over sort of active. I mean, that's the big thing. hundred percent, it is. Is um, a lot of people don't understand the, you know, markets do move in cycles, you mm. know, active over passive, passive generally better over picking fund managers, paying fees and not trying to time markets and focusing on, you know, compounding and regular investing and dollar cost averaging. And Pe- people, so sort of people are in camps and I actually hate this. Uh, it's something that the fire community is terrible uh, about doing. They stick to their camp and it's like, guys, property investing is no um, better than shares. Shares is not better than property. They're just different. You've got to figure out what's going to work best for you. They're incredible tools. I love both asset classes. I think I think what is really important is for an individual investor to consider and have assets in all different classes, mm. you know, and this yep. is the thing. A lot of property people will yep. not talk about yeah, it. Yeah, um, diversification, you know, the share right? market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and in fact, I think most property investors should not be investing in property personally yep. because they haven't bought good assets and they've got no idea what they're doing. Exactly so, right. Exactly right. You have to know yeah. what you're doing in property. That's, I always echo this point to people. I'm like, you can't stuff around like it's such a big risk if you don't know what you're doing yeah. in property but because the returns shot. exactly the returns are more lucrative but you need to know what you're doing but and that's that's the biggest pro i think or one of the biggest pros of passive index investing in the share market that you don't need to be warren buffett you don't need to know about anything yeah. i would encourage you to understand read a few books as mm-hmm. to why an index passive investing approach works why ets work because when the market craps itself you're gonna like if you don't know what you're doing then you're gonna sell low and that's the worst thing you can do but like that is the biggest benefit you don't need to know what you're doing in in shares like you don't need to pick stocks is what i'm saying uh but property you need to know what you're doing but if you have a skill set or experience to bring to the table you can clean up well i think the reality with property you have to pick stock you have to pick the stock. Yeah, you, you do. Know? Yeah, you ne- exactly um, right. You need to be an you expert. Yeah. Yeah, you in, can't buy an index in the property market. Well, you can buy rets. <laughs> like yeah, but the, that's the, not. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, it is property exposure, but it's not. I, don't, I agree with you. It's not the same as. Yeah. We well, forgot investment. to ask you to tell you at the start, Matt. So um, we do something called a property Dumbo, where it's just a story or something you've heard around property that. You know, it's good learning. Have you got from. one for us? <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually wrote a few down. Um, Excellent. Depending on how much time we got. But the the biggest, like the most obvious one uh, that I can think of, and I've got a personal experience with this just because we we um, have been through buying our first home lately, crazy that people are not getting building and pest inspections when buying a home. Like yep. the so market- in your situation? So in our situation- First of all, the market in where I live is just bananas, which I think is happening all over the country. It's just boggles my mind how yeah. property properties are worth so much at the moment. Like we're in London last year, and this sounds terrible, but when COVID hit, I was secretly like, "Yes, I know we're going to buy next year, and property is going to be rock bottom." There's going to, you know, I was like, "This is going to be great." <laughs> Holy crap! Did the complete opposite happen? Like, who could have ever predicted this was going to happen? It's just Very insane. Few. <laughs> mm. So. Basically, what you've got to do in my hometown at the moment is you've just got to go over asking price and hope that you secure the property within like the first week, just because there were so many people from Melbourne coming down and everything was getting snapped up. Mm-hmm. So we did the build, we um, put an offer on, uh, it got accepted, did a building inspection, and there was a massive structural issue that was a potential issue, but they couldn't tell me it was 100% going to happen. It basically could have been nothing or could have been everything in the next 10 years. And when you're spending half a million dollars on a house, I wasn't prepared to take that risk. And because the market was so hot, the 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 sellers were just happy to basically, you know, like not even negotiate with us because they're like, no, nah, you, you guys are too much work. We'll just pay. We'll take the, the next offer for, you know, $3,000 less, $5,000 less, whatever it was, and we'll just sell it and move on. So like, it really sucked that we had no negotiating power and no, like they, they weren't playing ball at all. So that was really bad, but that would be my number one, like 
you have to get a building and best inspection. So true. Yeah, it's crazy all the stories I'm hearing about people just buying unconditional, no building and pests, like insanity. Yeah. It sure is. Absolutely. I mean, you, uh, not only if you're paying 500000 probably 200000 that's for the house that you mm. haven't even done any, you know, just small checks on. Uh, no, even if you haven't done any building experience, um, we got even lots of building experience, you'd still be getting it done. Yeah. Awesome, Matt. I really appreciate your time today. It's, um, it's been very interesting. I think the fire movement is, there's lots to it. I think, and I think what I like about it is that sort of mindfulness side to it and being conscious of your decisions financially and how you spend your money and, you know, the importance of work, et cetera. So, um, yeah, thanks, Matt. No worries. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thanks so much for having me on. Appreciate your time. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... One thing that occurred to me in this conversation with Matt, which is really interesting, was I wonder whether in the frugality mindset there's a a bias against paying for advice. Now, we didn't talk about this with Matt, so I'm making an assumption here. Mm. But I think there's a lot of money to be saved by paying for good advice. Now, it's obviously difficult to find good advisors, but, you know, like even just accounting advice... Do you understand if you're going to buy an investment property, setting up the ownership entities or, you know, if you're going to buy an investment, live in it first or, you know, rent it out then live in it, what are the impacts on your future sale price and and tax liabilities, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I mean, that's just one example of paying for advice. And I would imagine that even in this fire movement, you know, there's a lot of talk about the difference between saving inside super, outside super and the tax rates and the pay downs, all of that sort of stuff. It actually is very, very complicated. And I guess this that's what this boot camp really is just about. Just don't forget to pay for advice, to think, okay, I need to get, particularly with super, for instance, the, the, the rules change all the time. So I need to make sure on hand, I've got somebody that can actually give me guidance that I trust so that I can make those good decisions and timely decisions decisions because, you know, it was mentioned there, you know, if you're close to the age at where you can get your, you know, if you're in the accumulation phase, you're going to do different things. And if you're actually close to the age where you're actually going to be able to draw down your super, you're going to do different things with, with money. And to not know that and to make mistakes, it's so easy to make mistakes with super. I mean, I've got a self-managed super fund and I very almost made a mistake, even though I thought I knew Mm. what I was doing and my accountant jumped onto me and went, ah, before you do that, you need to understand this. And so we would sort of went through this. So I've got an accountant on tap, but I almost made that mistake without actually checking because I actually did think I knew that answer, you know, and I didn't. So this stuff is really complicated whether you're trying to live frugally or not. Well, I think the problem with this is that the advice is free online, whether it's through, you know, they said they've got thousands on the Facebook group. It's not just them. You know, Scott Pape's Facebook groups have got 100,000. Uh, My Millennial Money, you've got, uh, even in the broken community, we've got fun, uh, Facebook groups. And mm. I've looked at these groups, I don't look at them very often. And, you know, whether it's in the broken community or whether it's in these financial groups, the advice that people who have not qualified, who don't know what they're doing, and the quality of that advice is really average. Um, you know, we've got brokers who are telling, use banks that, you know, wouldn't get approved the loan. And unfortunately, if you've got time to sit there and write these, replies on Facebook, you know, ultimately they're basing it on their experience and in property, it would definitely be happening. You'd have people who are saying, buy this property regionally. I did this. Oh. And, um, people love to base what they do on hindsight and anecdotal advice really. And so you got to be really careful when you're uh, educating yourself is you don't get in this sort of echo changer of confirmation bias and surrounding people that don't know much more than you. So <laughs> careful where you get your advice from. Absolutely. Actually on that, um, you know, I'm in the My Millennial Money group and may, I'm in there really because I want to, as part of research for Home Buyer Academy, I really do want to get in there and understand what questions are plaguing first home buyers, et cetera, et cetera. And, and every now and then I'll make a comment because I can't help myself, but some of the stuff, oh, and this is the problem with all of these groups, is that if the people, if the community is providing answers that's a bit scary because, you know, a lot of that community and I read some of this stuff and I think these people just have no idea what they're doing and saying and, and you know, hopefully nobody's taking the advice but there's a lot of free advice out there and, yeah, so that's this boot camp. Pay for you advice for it, from experts. <laughs> Next 
episode, we are going to uncover the secret to capital growth. Can data tell us what we need to look for in order to maximise the return on our investments and minimise risk? Is it possible? Well, to find out, you're going to have to tune in. We're interviewing Jeremy Shepherd. He's the head of research at Select Residential Property, and he claims to have cracked the code of capital growth. So please join us. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.